As Atlanta United prepare for the MLS playoffs, it's a great pleasure to welcome their manager, Gonzalo Pineda, to discuss the club's preparations for the postseason, his own journey, and of course, being a former international with El Tri, we might just chat about a pretty big game happening this Friday as the USMNT face Mexico in CONCACAF World Cup qualifiers. Always good to chat with a Latino manager making moves in MLS. Que golazo! Gonzalo Pineda begins right now. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Que Golazo. Thank you so much for being part of the family. We're on Twitter, Que Golazo Pod, YouTube.com forward slash Que Golazo, CBS Sports, your CBS Sports app, and, of course, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Stitcher. Right then, enough of that. I am very happy to welcome Gonzalo Pineda, Atlanta United's manager, as they get ready for the players. This is in English, but I just want it in Spanish from uh, Latin American brother to another one. Gonzalo, ¿cómo estás, compadre? Hola, ¿qué tal, Luis Miguel? Eh, muy, muy contento de estar aquí con ustedes en, en, en su podcast. Very happy to be here with you, Luis Miguel, and uh, just ready to go. Thank you so much for doing the translation on both sides. It cut my work off to do that, Gonzalo. I appreciate it. Welcome to the show, my friend. Uh, let's get going. First of all, uh, let's talk about Atlanta United. Uh, they were 10th in the East when you took over, and now you're heading to the playoffs. I just wanted to know how you're feeling about it, um, and also what were your objectives when you took the job as you look ahead to the postseason? Well, it's a, it's a probably short uh, question, but probably deserves a longer answer because, uh, yes, I, I received the team in, with te, uh, in 10th place, uh, not a lot of points, and, uh, and well, uh, by my count, since I was announced as, as a coach uh, of Atlanta United, uh, we are the top team in terms of points production. So we, we, we hit 33 points since that day, and uh, we are tied with Colorado, with Vancouver, with New England in more points in that period of time. So that tells you a lot about the comeback that the players uh, had to do to be now in playoffs and their resilient mentality that they need to prove. So I'm very, very proud of the response of the team. I cannot take credit for those 33 points because actually Rob Valentino and Ryan and all the rest of the staff uh, took over for three more games after my announcement because I had the COVID. But I can tell you that I'm very proud of the coaching staff in general and the staff and the players for uh, making such an impressive comeback in that part uh, of the year. Absolutely. A fantastic comeback and well done for Atlanta United to making the postseason. I did want to go back a little bit, Gonzalo. You obviously have coaching experience, notably, of course, assistant coach with Seattle Sounders, but this is your first coaching job and it's not a small club, of course. What do you think was the determinant factor that sold Darren Eels to your vision. What? Why did he go with you, Gonzalo? Well, I, I don't know. Probably you should <laughs> you should you should ask uh, Darren and Carlos. But uh, I, I can tell you that uh, what I try to present to them is a coach that is is hungry. First, number one, I'm very hungry. I'm really trying to prove myself to to go to the next step, which is this, which is uh, coaching. Uh, and uh, I'm someone that being prepared myself for a long time ago, uh, not just as a coach, but also as a player. I think it's a great preparation to be in this position because I know what the players may feel, what they go through in their careers, the moments of a career, a young player, a, an old player, a guy with aspirations to go to Europe, uh, a player that is in the national team right now and all the different uh, coaching points that he gets from, you know, different coaches. So so I get all that experience. And then obviously my experience with Seattle, which has been a, a fantastical journey uh, with a great mentor like Brian Schmetzer. So I, I'm someone that I've been around this sport and preparing myself for this challenge from, uh, you know, since a long time ago. Uh, and then obviously knowing the league, I think that I think that probably is one of the key factors that I know the league. I know how uh, conference operates, how the postseason operates, the offseason, the rules, bringing players, TAM, DPs, young DPs, all that stuff. Uh, and, and, and that I think that that took in consideration for them to 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 put me in this position. You mentioned uh, Brian Schmetzer, of course. During your time as assistant coach there, the Sounders lifted the MLS Cup trophy in 2019, finished second in 17 and 20, 
What did you learn specifically? I mean, I'm sure it can be a long list, a great coach, uh, Brian Schmetcher, but anything specific that you learned under him? Yes, many, many lessons. As you said, it's uh, a long period of time next to him, obviously four and a half years as, uh, as his assistant and two years as his player. So I learned a lot from him, uh, but probably one of the key areas was obviously the management and the management, not just, you know, managing Clint Dempsey, managing Obafemi Martins, managing, you know, uh, Nicolo Deiro, Raul Ruiz as big players, Ossi Alonso. So uh, managing expectations, but not, not just that, but managing the staff, managing the coaching staff, managing the media, managing all the club. It's, it's just a great manager. And, and everything that starts for me, the main lesson is, you have to be a good people person. And that's that's the main factor from Brian. He's a great guy. And from there, he lays out expectations. He tried to make you accountable for those. And he helps you to, to get there. So he's a great, great mentor in many, many different ways. Uh, but probably on that side, on the management, is the one that has impressed me the most. Yeah, I'm really glad as a Peruvian that you mentioned Raul Ruiz, by the way. So thank you for that part as well. Hey, I'm very interested in this Gonzalo, as we know, and it's kind of off the cuff. I'm not really going to talk about it, but Xavi entering Barcelona, he said something really interesting. And now that I'm talking to you, I feel like you feel the same way. Xavi said that one of his first objectives with Barcelona is to talk to every single player and help them mentally and physically, but really most importantly, mentally see what they are, where they are, where they see their problems themselves and how they can, he can help them advance and not just on the pitch, but psychologically. And I feel that when you're talking to me, that's also important to you. Would you, would you say that's true to you? It's important to be a good man manager, helping your team and players be strong mentally, psychologically in order to perform physically. Yes, I relate to that for sure. That's uh, that was actually one of my uh, main objectives at the when I just took over. Uh, you beat him to it, then. <laughs> I didn't know. I didn't know that Xavi was gonna do that. But uh, that's that's what I just did. I mean, I reach out to all of them individually through text message. Some of them. Uh, through social media because I couldn't get through the the, the cell phone, but but uh, I get through all of them, and then I try to have individual meetings with them regularly and try to see their objectives. With some players, it's easier because they are playing, they are motivating. It's just pushing them to the next level slowly by slowly. Uh, but also, you know, dealing with guys that haven't played a lot and they are upset, of course, and how I am helping them to get where they want to. Uh, but it's difficult when you can play only 11 players. So I understand that position, but still I, I have to work a lot with their minds. I agree with Javi. I don't know if he phrased it that, this way, but mentally it's very important, especially when you are struggling. Uh, when you're in a good place as a team, as, as an individual, uh, you have to go there and think in the resilience and how you can overcome adversity. And that's something that I felt that the players you know, uh, did very well. And mentally, we're always talking about the mentality of the team, the mentality of the team, the mentality of them, but also individually, how they prepare themselves to succeed. I think I really see that. And a friend of the show, by the way, I know him well, in Joseph Martinez, uh, to be honest with you. I see I see a sense of confidence revitalizing itself. Obviously, he came back from injury and everything. But, you know, that golazo that he scored in the final game of postseason. But also, do you see a sense of fire that has been born in him as well coming into the postseason? Yes. I, I mean, not just him. I, I Again, I, I told you this before, like I'm very proud of the effort that they put into this you know, period of time. And mm. yet Joseph is one of those. He's actually one of the leaders of the team that he is the one that probably everybody looks at when things are not going well. And he responds with those type of lessons, right? And uh, so it's a good response. And again, it's just how, how we can be resilient, how we can overcome adversity, how we can be better every day. Uh, uh, it's very easy to be motivated. That's something that I heard here in, in Atlanta. It's, it's very easy to be motivated, but what you actually need is to be committed. It's different. Uh, motivated, I can be one day motivated. Yes, I'm going to train like the best, but if I'm not committed, next day I won't be the best. Uh, I will go down, depressed. No, we need commitment. And that's what these players uh, are proving to themselves, that they are committed to the cause. 
A perfect balance between motivation and commitment. Well said there. I, I want to talk to you about something. You've played, obviously, Liga MX, uh, Seattle Sounders. You know Seattle very well. And now you're in Atlanta. And Atlanta, I know it well. My friend Kevin Egan, of course, lives it every day when he commentates. But Atlanta is a soccer town. I mean, Atlanta Braves had 43,000 in attendance for Game 4 of the World Series uh, last month. And on the same night, just a few miles away, the Mercedes-Benz Stadium had 42,000 to watch Atlanta United play Toronto. How do you feel the passion is in that city, uh, especially when it's a packed stadium? H how do you see it? Do you, do you echo the sentiment that Atlanta is a soccer city and it's super passionate? Yes, I agree. I agree 100%. Uh, everywhere I go, every little street that I see, there are a lot of soccer fields. Uh, you know, when you come to the United States, you think, you know, baseball fields, basketball fields, and uh, American football fields, uh, tennis fields. But but you look at, uh, you know, all the parks and everyone has a soccer field. And you can see the passion of the people in Atlanta. Uh, it's happening a lot that, you know, I present myself and they said, oh, you look familiar. Oh, yeah, yeah, you are the coach. Oh, yeah, you're the coach of Atlanta. So, you know. <laughs> No, it's it's happening more often, and and it's just it's just I feel like uh, everybody's aware of Atlanta United. Like uh, it's a team that uh, is is in their hearts, and that connection. I talk about this all the time. The connection between our players and the fans is what makes a club successful. Is that connection when the players play with the same passion that the fans have on the standings, we are in a good standard. And that's the standard that we want to bring for, for us. So the game against NYCFC then, because that's at Yankee Stadium, it's not at Mercedes-Benz Stadium. Do you think that's a disadvantage? Does it matter to you that you're not playing at home or it doesn't matter to you? You think that either way we're going to get the job done, but do you see that not being at Mercedes-Benz is a disadvantage? Well, I would say that it's nicer to win in front of your fans. That's what I would say. Obviously, share that moment with your fans in your stadium. It's always, uh, you know, a very nice feeling because you feel at home and all that. But I can tell you that there are also some little advantages of playing away. Maybe the team at home is more forced to play in a certain way because their fans, uh, the expectations of the fans, because they feel more pressure too. So uh, there are some little nuances in the game that we can take in, into our advantage, but certainly uh, you always prefer to play at home for sure. I wanted to ask something about you specifically. I heard that... You were considering retirement, right? Before Querétaro, before, after that, sorry, you were considering retirement. And then the Sounders came knocking at your door. How much convincing did you need to move to MLS? Uh, honestly, it was like a second chance for me. I was in that period of time where I was thinking the next stage of my career, of my life too, because I had two small children at that moment. My son was three, I think, and my daughter two or something like that. And I was uh, just reflecting on what do I want. I had a small academy in, in Puebla. I had 150 kids and I was coaching the under 17 team. Uh, I was dealing with some pubalgia issues. I actually did the surgery and I was just, just feeling like, yeah, the next path for me is coaching and I can start here in Puebla. It's a very nice city to live and slowly by slowly going, progressing my career as a coach. And I was thinking very, very hard on that. And then a friend came back to me like saying, hey, there might be a chance in MLS. Would you take it? And I said, yeah, it sounds good if, you know, if it is the right team and I like it and all that, why not? And actually something that not many people know is that the first team that I did the tryouts for was uh, Chicago Fire. So oh, I went to Chicago. Yeah, it was six months before Seattle, right after Querétaro. And uh, I went there uh, and I did the tryouts, but I started to feel my pubalgia again uh, after three days. And then I said, no, no more. Uh, they also said, like, no, that we passed because you are injured. And I came back. I did my surgery. Six months later, I went to Seattle in preseason and did my my uh, tryouts with them. And after, I think, seven days, ten days, I don't remember, I was signed with Seattle Sounders. And I was very, very happy. 
And the rest is history, as they say, as obviously they helped you towards your coaching experience as well. Uh, very, very quickly on this, you, you, you have a great resume playing experience, as I mentioned, in Liga MX, and obviously with Seattle Sanders in MLS. As we look at 2021 and look ahead to 2022, of course, and the expansion as well of the league's uh, cup as well, do you think that MLS is getting closer and closer now to really worrying, I guess, for lack of a better word, of Liga MX team saying, you know what, MLS is getting their stuff together and they're getting better and better. Do you think that that's uh, true? How do you see it? Yeah, I mean, uh, it's it's really hard for me to talk about this topic because I always get murdered by Mexican fans <laughs> when I talk well about that's MLS. True, you can be diplomatic. But, uh, it's okay, Gonzalo. Yeah, but what I've been saying is nothing controversial. It's just what I've seen is that the progression of MLS being very, very good is even since the days where I was playing, uh, like the, just just talking about the style. Like in mm -hmm. 2014, most of the teams were playing four for two, direct play, long balls, uh, second balls, and and you know just the teams that had maybe two or three good. The piece they were doing good in the league. It was more of that type of league, and the progression since seven, eight years ago to this moment, where you can see many different styles, different formations, coaches from Europe coming here, growing in America, coaches from South America, great coaches like Tata Martino, like Patrick Vieira, like uh, you, you know, uh, uh, many, many coaches that be Almeida, here. right? Yeah, Almeida, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, it's just uh, amazing how the, the league has been progressing and uh, the style is getting better. Many teams are playing very good football and if not, they are playing a very dynamic style, uh, disruptive style that is very, uh, you know, enjoyable at times. And, and the quality of the players that are coming to the league, younger and younger DPs and, and selling players to Europe and young, talented American players being sold in Europe. I think the league in general is progressing very well. Now, the comparison is what I hate because everyone wants to see, oh, yeah. MLS is better than Mexican League or Mexican League. I mean, the comparison has many, many angles, right? So what do you want to compare? Just the competition, CONCACAF, Champions League, and that's all you're comparing. That timing of the year where maybe Mexican teams are more prepared, more ready to go. Uh, do you want to measure ratings on TV? Do you want to measure attendance to the stadium? Do you want to, to, to uh, compare marketing, players, value of the clubs? What do you want to compare? So there are many, many, you know, different ways to compare the leagues. But from a soccer side, I can tell you that the progression of MLS has been fantastic. And I think if the tendency keeps going in the same direction, uh, MLS in a few years is going to be a very, very, very good league in the world. Very, very good times ahead. We're here with Gonzalo Pineda, Atlanta United's manager. We're nearly done with ella. Casi terminamos, Gonzalo. I wanted to just quickly turn ahead for Friday. A big game as USA face Mexico. Uh, of course, you know this region very well as a player and a coach. You represented Mexico more than 40 appearances, including, of course, World Cup qualifiers. You've played in both domestic leagues that we've just talked about. Um, how do you see the region, by the way, not just Mexico or the USMNT, but also the emergence of Canada, who are doing very well? How do you see the emergence of CONCACAF nations right now? Well, I can I can say that North America part, uh, not just Central America, has been more dominant in the last two years. I think Canada, especially talking about the growth of MLS, I think a lot of the growth of Canada has something to do with the growth of MLS because a lot mm -hmm. of those players in Vancouver, in you know, in Toronto, in Montreal, and even the interaction with some other clubs uh, is helping. Uh, the development of Canada as a country, and they've been very, very uh, in, uh, impressive in, in, in this uh, qualifying. Uh, so I think Canada, the US, and Mexico are for sure now the top teams in, in the area. But I'm impressed also with the process of Salvador. I think the coach has been doing well, even though there are limitations in terms of the league, the budget, the players, but uh, it's one that I really like. 
Uh, but I think Costa Rica went down a little bit on the performance. Honduras has been going down a little bit in terms of what we always expect from those two countries. But uh, it's just good for the league that, for I'm sorry, for the area to have more and more impressive teams, and hopefully the level of the whole area uh, keeps growing to to challenge more often the top two teams, which is always Mexico and the U.S. All right. Well, Mexico and the U.S. are facing each other this Friday. What's a good result for you here? Obviously, Mexico uh, is is your love, is your path. But Miles Robinson, what if he starts? How about a goal for Miles for the U.S. But Mexico win? Is that is that what you want? How do you see that game on Friday? Yeah, for sure. I would love if Miles score not just one but two goals. It's just <laughs> I still want Mexico to win four two or five two. I mean, that that doesn't change the fact that I am very passionate about Mexico and I mean I, I, I wear that jersey I went to a World Cup so I cannot change my colors uh, obviously I'm very happy about the l- development of Miles Robinson in the national team he's been impressive playing almost every game this year for his national team uh, Christian Roland being part of that one who you know is one that I love from Seattle uh, and, and just uh, in general I, I have uh, good feelings, I would say, about the U.S. national team, except when they face uh, Mexico, because that's a special game for me. Well, let me ask you this then. Who is under more pressure in this game, do you think? Tata Martino or Greg Berhalter? Well, uh, it's different. I think the type of pressure that both have is a little bit different. I think uh, Tata Martino has more pressure because of, you know, uh, Mexico... Uh, the Mexican media is always pushing for Mexico to win every game and probably a bit unrealistic on their side because I don't think it's the case that Mexico has to win every every game. And we have to recognize in Mexico that the, the, the area is growing, as we said before. But uh, the pressure of being always on top of everyone else and the pressure of not just winning but playing good football and the pressure of every game matters, I think at some point, you know, coaches, we can get tired of that type of pressure at times. So I don't know if over the years Tata Martino is a little bit, you know, tired about that type of unfair pressure from media, from fans. Uh, but I don't I don't think the team in general is having a bad moment. I think they are doing good. They have good players. And I think Mexico is going to be in the next World Cup. Uh, no problems. The, the challenges will come for me in that World Cup. And that's where we will see the best side of Mexico. Absolutely right. Uh, Gonzalo Pineda, it's an absolute pleasure to have you as part of Kego Lasso. Make sure that you tune into the MLS playoffs as Atlanta United face NYCFC. And if you come over here in New York, Gonzalo, maybe we'll, 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 we'll go out. I'll show you some good Mexican spots, but more importantly, some good Peruvian spots. And maybe we can make that happen. But Gonzalo Pineda, the best of luck to you with Atlanta United, of course, as they get ready for the MLS playoffs. Thank you so much for being part of the show. Muchas gracias, compadre. Thank you very much, Luis Miguel. All the best in the future. Muchas gracias, Luis Miguel. Saludos. Make sure to follow us on Kego Lasso Pod on Twitter, youtube.com forward slash Kego Lasso, CBS Sports and your CBS Sports app. We're also on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher. Thank you so much and enjoy the rest of your week.